Now this video is going to change at least one person's life in a positively transformative way. Of that I am sure. So it really doesn't matter if 10,000 people watch it or a million people watch it. This is me, a watchmaker, giving self-help advice. You know, bound to fail. But trust me, bear with it. There is potentially much value for you in what follows. Okay, Rolex, Omega, Patek Philippe, Alang and Zona, all of these brands, and I could go on, they're really successful. And they've been successful in a harsh environment for decades and decades. So what's their secret? And is it something that an individual person can learn? Because if so, that would be transformative. So I will talk about Rolex more than I talk about any of the others. Just to be clear, I have absolutely no affiliation with Rolex or any other watch brand. In fact, I was a soldier for 20 years and I know what it is to be fully and completely owned and I have no desire to be owned again in the future. Okay, enough of that. Let's have a look at this first habit. Okay, so this is a Rolex 157 movement. Now, Rolex started to produce this series of movements in 1957, but this one, this is sat inside a Rolex mill sub from 1973. So it's towards the end of a 20 year run for this movement from Rolex. And this is the Rolex 3035, came out in 1977, a very memorable year. I was 13 for the Queen's Jubilee and it ran all the way till 1988, by which time I'm a captain in the British Army. The Rolex 3135, this is my favorite movement of all time. Introduced in 1988 and ran right the way through to 2010 and I'm not even sure if they're still using it now. And this is the most modern ladies Rolex. It's the Rolex 2235. But the main point here is the amount of time spent by Rolex in creating these movements, a huge amount of investment in time, and then the amount of time that they use those movements in to create watches. So that's it. The first habit is create assets, and then utilize those assets over a long period of time. And you can do this in your own life, regardless of what it is. But an asset is really just anything that brings you benefit. So it doesn't have to be based on monetary reward. It could be your involvement with a voluntary group or the setting up of a voluntary group. You just have to think what it is that brings you benefit and then put effort in to building it. That is the first habit. So the second habit is pretty obvious in what it is. And it is this, I'm gonna tell you it right now. The second habit is be good at what you do. Now, Rolex, Jeje Le Coutre, Elang and Zona. These guys, they all make beautiful watches. They are all good at making watches. So, you know, if you want to succeed, you've got to be good at what you do. That's obvious, right? But what is a lot less obvious is how you get there. How do you become good at what you do? And I think there were really two stages to that. And the first is actually more difficult than the second because the first is, it's really tricky. It's finding out what it is that you want to do. So this is really, really important, but also a little bit outside of my area of expertise, but I can give you my own experience because these are the things to watch for. For me, it worked like this. I noticed that my mind would repeatedly sort of wander back to me visualizing myself fixing a watch. So if you find your, your own mind wandering back to a kind of little happy place where you're doing this thing that you want to do, 
that's a first good sign. A second sign is that you become really hungry for any information about this thing that you want to do. For example, you spend endless hours on YouTube watching videos and you, you buy books about the subject and here's the thing, you actually read them. I mean, you actually read the books that you buy. Now, if you do these things that I mentioned above consistently for more than two years without really deviating significantly onto anything else, then I think there's a good chance that you've probably found the thing that you really want to do. And having found it, you then need to become good at it because you now can become good at it. Becoming good at it requires one thing really, uh, practice, a daily practice. And that's it, there's no, there's no big secret to it. You just have to allocate the time in a day such as that is available to you to practice and practice every day. I think your average human being is built in a way that if you practice, you cannot help but to become good at it. And if it is the thing that you really want to do, then you will become good at it. So when I'm fixing a Rolex watch, one thing that is always very, very apparent to me is it's a great watch. These guys make great watches. These guys are good at what they do, but becoming good at what you do is an easy. Firstly, you have to know what it is you want to do, and then you have to put in the work and practice. But that is the second habit for success. Be good at what you do. All successful watch companies communicate well. They get their message out and they get their message out constantly. Rolex is the absolute master at this. Rolex make great watches, but if they're better at anything, even than making their watches, they are brilliant at marketing. They market their product amazingly well, and they also keep it in the public's mind constantly. It doesn't really matter where you go. You can be going to the tennis at Wimbledon, or the Grand Prix, or driving on the Chiswick flyover into London, or landing at an airport, you are repeatedly reminded that Rolex is out there and it is a product to which you maybe should think about aspiring. So if you want to succeed in what you're doing, and, it, and, and again, it doesn't matter what that thing is, you might be, for example, putting on a really brilliant amateur dramatics show. I have some experience in this. And it may be the best show that your amateur dramatics society has ever done. But if you don't get the communications right, nobody will come to see it. And there is nothing more soul destroying than having put in huge amounts of work on something. And you walk onto the stage and there's three people looking at you and one of them is asleep. So communication, the right communication, but also pretty constant. You have to communicate and get your message out constantly if you want to be a success. So you saw the quote there from Leo Tolstoy and I guess it was in his interest to write that because his novels are huge and you need shed loads of patience uh, to get to the end. But that quote and the quote from Samuel Johnson really 
define the two most important characteristics of any successful watch company. They all show patience and they all show perseverance. And there's a difference between the two. Perseverance is really the ability to carry on when things don't go right. You, you don't get the results that you're expecting, but you persevere, you keep on going, you put right the things that are stopping you getting the results that you need to get. And if you are creating a watch movement where the tolerances that you're dealing with are in tens of microns, even microns themselves, that's a thousandth of a millimeter success or failure in watchmaking is measured in thousands of millimeters. So perseverance to get everything to fit just right is absolutely essential to success in watchmaking. And the root of success with patience, I guess, is learning to understand that results will not come quickly. In any endeavor that is complex and worthwhile, it's unlikely that results will come quickly. And it's almost not desirable that they do. An overnight success is often a contradiction in terms because it's success that's built on very thin ice. And history shows us that things can go pear-shaped quite quickly. So habit number four is the practice of patience and perseverance, which patiently brings us on to habit number five, which is all to do with investing. And I'm going to give you an example from Rolex. Again, typical Rolex, spending huge amounts of investment, consuming that investment time and dollars, choosing exactly the right thing, in my view, to invest in. Now, there's a component inside a watch called a hairspring, and it's the most essential component to a thing called simple harmonic motion. And simple harmonic motion is really the area of physics that defines, for example, how a pendulum inside a clock will swing or the balance inside a watch will swing. So it is right at the center of what is important in watchmaking. And Rolex spent years and years and years developing a thing called the Parachrom hairspring. Now, hairsprings are vulnerable to two things. They're vulnerable to magnetism and changes in temperature. So Rolex developed this hairspring that would really be immune to variations in both of these things. So when you're deciding to use up your own really, really valuable time, and it is the most valuable asset that you possess, that anyone possesses, and you're gonna use that time to invest in something, the key thing is to be really, really careful that you are investing in the right things. The things that strike to the heart of what you are trying to succeed in. For example, you may want to go and do business in another country. Well, you need to invest time in the language of that country, for example. And once you have created the ability to speak that language, that remains an asset. That is a key investment in a key part of your strategy. So habit number five is investing in yourself wisely and carefully. Before I finish on the topic of investing, there's one other opportunity that I'd like to make you aware of. Now, you remember back in May, I told you about this organization called Masterworks. 
What they've done is they've opened up the possibility for everybody, that's you, me, anybody, to invest in contemporary art. As I said back in May, I am a big fan of art. So I'm not a financial or investment guru. I just love art. And the beauty of Masterworks is you don't have to be a guru. So this partnership with Masterworks for me was actually just a no-brainer. So in this video, I've been talking about the habits that are required to create, you know, fine, timeless pieces. And I, I think we all understand that because just as a Patek or a Fascheron or a Audemars Piquet can double or triple in value, the same thing can happen with art. But here's the thing. It's easier to invest with masterworks than to find one of those watches on the market for a reasonable price. And I guess that's why the consulting firm McKinsey says that leading financial institutions have been reallocating 30 to 50% of their portfolios into alternative assets like fine and contemporary art. In fact, and this is quite startling, in the last 25 years, contemporary art prices have outpaced the S&P 500 by a staggering 131%. Now, before Masterworks, you needed millions of dollars to invest in the art market. But with Masterworks, you can invest in shares of pieces from legends like Picasso and Monet and Banksy, artists whose work have shown historical appreciation in value. And by investing in these, Masterworks has delivered on average 29% for investors. So there's a special link in the description. It's actually right at the top of the description uh, to this video. And by using it, you can skip the waitlist and, and start investing uh, with Masterworks. And for those of you that like the detail, this is important. The net estimated returns for all realized and unrealized offerings is 15.3% from inception through to June of this year, that's 2022. Now you do need to see the important regulations and performance disclosures. And there's also a link in the description about that. So let's face it, on this journey towards achieving the goal or goals that you want to achieve, you're not going to be able to control everything. And if you try, and I don't recommend it, you're, you're just going to end up, you know, falling over in a gibbering heap somewhere. And now there are probably some things though that maybe you can control. And if you can, and they are critical to your success, then you should try and bring those under control as soon as possible. For example, I make my own line of watches, but I don't manufacture all the parts. I buy the movement in from Switzerland. I mean, it's a lovely, lovely movement, but I don't make it. And I only do one line of watch and I only currently use that movement. So if I can't get hold of that movement, if my supply runs out, then that, that is a key weakness in my strategy. And successful watch companies, far bigger and with far more resources than myself, they will bring all of this stuff under their control. I mean, the finest example of this, again, is Rolex. You know, Rolex produces watches made of precious metals, for example, gold and rose gold and platinum and to make sure that they always get the supply of precious metals that they want to the standard that they require it rolex has actually invested in its own foundry it's actually brought the production of that gold under its own control because it considers it vital to its business so habit number six is really just bringing everything that you can control, and that is important, so you should control it under your control as soon as you possibly can.
I couldn't find a suitable quote for this last habit, so I thought about it and I made one up, which I have to say I'm rather proud of, smugly. Logically, it's not possible to succeed in any particular environment if you don't have any agency or power to operate within that environment. You just can't affect things enough if you have no power. And where then does that power come from? Well, it comes from a number of areas, I guess, but one really particularly important thing are the stories that surround your particular endeavor. So I guess what I'm saying here is some kind of romantic context for what you're doing is really, really important. For example, in the 70s, Rolex brought out the Submariner and they called it the Submariner. They didn't call it the 5513 with the 1570 inside it because that's just a bunch of numbers. But Submariner, now that's immediately got, you know, we're talking Jules Verne, 20,000 leagues under the sea. That is a story and the story has romance. Patek Philippe, they have the Nautilus. I mean, the Nautilus is the actual submarine in Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So it's helpful to nurture romanticism about that which you are trying to succeed. So that is the last habit. Nurture romanticism so that you have a really good story about what it is you're trying to do. Guys, I hope this has been helpful. I have really tried to uh, to give you some useful stuff here. So uh, I hope that's been of use. There we are.